So rule three is a, it's called the 95% exception. And it's very rarely used. And it basically says you can identify as many properties as you want, regardless of their value, but you have to buy 95% of everything you've identified. Mm -hmm. So typically you're gonna identify more, four or more properties, because if you're identifying less than four, you use a three property rule. And the total value of those properties is gonna be more than twice the value of the property that you sold. And so, and you basically have to buy everything you've identified. So it's typically, I've only seen it used like five or six times. It's very rarely used. So selling one property, buying one property, probably the three property rule. Mm -hmm. Selling one property, buying multiple properties, probably the 200% rule. And in your experience, now 20 years, uh, obviously uh, investors have different needs. Have you seen some more creative ways to use the exchanges or scenarios so that it would fit their, either their estate planning or something else they were looking for? Yeah, so we see lots of creative things people do with 1031. Uh, we had a client one time at a large office building uh, in El Segundo. He uh, came to me and said, I'm just going to sell this building, pay my taxes, put my money in the bank. Uh, I've got three boys. Uh, and I know that if I keep this building, that they are just going to tear each other apart. Um, and uh, and I don't want that to happen. I want them to you know, keep their relationships. And so I said, well, why don't you do this? Why don't you sell the building, do a 1031 exchange, give each son a budget that they can work with and have them pick their own building. Mm -hmm. So well, why should I have them pick their own building? They don't know a lot about real estate. I said, because if you pick the three assets and one outperforms the other mm -hmm. two, the other sons are going to feel like that they kind of got chipped. So he said, that's a great idea. So he did. So he sold his building. He, he each son identified a property that they wanted to purchase. They ended up using the 200% rule because I think he ended up identifying five properties. But so they closed on each of these three properties. He created a trust for each one after the fact made that son the beneficiary and the trustee of the trust. So they kind of run the property. Mm -hmm. And that way, when he passes away, the, the sons will get the property. They'll get a step up in basis. It'll eliminate the taxes, but it also eliminate any infighting because each individual son got to pick their own property. So if one of the properties outperforms the other one, it's no big trouble with the son, right? Now, so let's stay with this for a minute. So I think taking it a step further, if the father wanted the sons to start enjoying the income or a portion of the income, he actually could have them collect the monies and then pay them a management fee on the sure. books while he's still the owner, 100%, right? hundred percent. Yeah, hundred okay. percent. Absolutely. Um, and another thing we're seeing people do is that uh, as the baby boomer generation is getting older, you know, one of the things they're looking to do, you know, as retirement is they may not want to retire in California. Maybe it's very expensive to live here, or maybe they want to retire in a different part of California. Maybe they want to be in, Palm Desert, you know, Indian Wells, Rancho Mirage, th those areas. And so they're selling assets off. Like I just had a client not that long ago. They sold an apartment building. It was 2.5 million. They took 500,000 of the 2.5 and used it to exchange into a home in La Quinta. And that home, they're going to hold it as a vacation investment property for a couple of years. The 2 million that was left over, they used it to buy traditional investment property. It was another apartment building. Mm -hmm. And then they said about five or six years down the road that they think what they're going to do is they're going to convert that property that they purchased in the desert into their retirement home. Mm -hmm. And they'll sell the property that they have here. We also see that baby boomer generation buying homes that their kids are renting out. Uh, and so, you know, it's very expensive, obviously, you know, um, you know, you've got a lot of kids. I've got a lot of kids, right? You know, as they as we see them get older, right? We look at the price values of real estate, and we think, <clears throat> how are our kids ever going to afford to buy these houses, right? So, what some of the parents are doing is they're selling off some of their investment property or, or an investment property and using the money, a portion of the money, or sometimes all of the money, to buy a house that their son or daughter mm -hmm. then lives in, and they pay them rent, right? And they hold it as an investment. They make you know, create a trust so that when they pass away, that the, the, you know, son or daughter will get that house and it'll be, you know, it's their primary residence, it'll be their home. So there's lots of interesting things that you can do with 1031. You can combine tax codes with section 1031 with section 121, the primary residency exclusion. So there's, there's an infinite number of things really. So to do. that point, to, to, to draw the I concept out a little further. So if I sell an apartment building and I take a portion of the proceeds and I buy a home that ideally say I want to use as a vacation home down the road, 
I first must rent it out for two years. Is that correct? And then I can convert it? So there's a revenue ruling out there that says any property that's held as an investment for two years or more in an audit, the IRS won't challenge the held for investment portion of the exchange, which means that as long as I hold it as an investment for at least two years, after that, I can pretty much do whatever I want with it. Now, a vacation home can qualify as an investment if it's used less than two weeks out of the year by the owner or less than 10% of the time it's been rented, right? So if you rent it out for 200 days, you can use it for 20 and you have to show at least two weeks of income on it. So you could actually have a vacation home. You could use it sparingly for the first couple of years, rent it out, make sure that you rent it out for at least two weeks a year. And then after that two years were up, you pretty much do whatever you want with it. Oh, wow. So with the popularity of Airbnb, could I, again, sell an apartment building, buy a house, and a portion of the time it's Airbnb, and same idea, I can use it a portion of the yeah, time as absolutely. well. And any time that you spend in that home making improvements doesn't count against your two weeks. <laughs> so if I used it as an Airbnb, and then after it was done, I went out there and cleaned it and you know fixed a leaky faucet or whatever, painted a bathroom or did some maintenance to it, it doesn't count against the two weeks that I get to spend there. Sure. So, um, so that's kind of a creative. fixing that leaky faucet might take a week or so. Yeah, right? about that. <laughs> yeah, we do have clients that make lots of repairs to their properties. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And to wrap up here, obviously, my view of the marketplace is very specific. You know, LA County, San Bernardino County, multifamily, and I read articles on the other uh, facets of commercial real estate. But you definitely have a grander eye view because you have clients that own industrial and office space and, and uh, the rest. What's your take on the market currently? So if you would ask me that, you know, in January, or February of this year, I would have said, uh, you know, we're definitely headed you know, down the path of being having, you know, a slower year. Uh, and but uh, as the Fed has lowered rates uh, and actually when he, once he said actually was going to raise rates, it really kind of added fuel to the market. And the market has continued to, to be robust. Uh, last month, we did uh, 400 more deals na nationally than we had done uh, you know, uh, since 2005. So it was yeah. the best month ever. And you're seeing it across really you know, a lot of different product types, right? So it's always interesting to me. And a client I talked to about two weeks ago, and she said, you know, I want to buy an apartment building, I think, with my 1031 exchange money. And I said, okay. Uh, she said, do you know anybody that you can refer me to? And I said, well, yeah, yeah. Apartments, uh, you know, on the commercial side, as you know, right, it's mm -hmm. very specific, mm -hmm. right? So you even within your team have people like you understand apartments in, you know, your whole marketplace, but you even have people on your team that are very specific mm -hmm. to very specific markets, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's interesting that when somebody comes to me and says, oh, I'm looking for an apartment building, I'm like, where are you looking like what price are you looking in like exactly where are you looking because there's not just you know you can't just refer it to one person mm -hmm. so um you know for us we are along a huge segment line right so we have net lease we have industrial commercial uh, hospitality is extremely hot right now right and if you're on the apartment side or the industrial side you're like you know i don't you don't really look at the hotel market because there's really not a reason to look at it but hospitality is very uh, strong right now. And then those baby boomers are very strong too. You know, the, the people that own the duplexes, the single families that are rentals that are looking to kind of reposition those assets. And so we definitely see in the market, uh, I see it as strong. And to be honest with you, looking forward to uh, the end of next year, I see it, it probably next year being very strong as well. Now, my question, because in the taping of this, we're here in November 2019. So you guys already have exchanges that are in place. You know somewhat what the first quarter will look like. It looks like a strong first quarter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to continue to be strong for the first quarter. Because remember that, you know, when these deals are closing, you know, October, November, December, that money's not being deployed mm -hmm. into the market. Many times our average exchange in Southern California uh, is uh, 61 days. So 61 days from trans, you know, from when they sell to when they purchase, that's their average. Uh, it's interesting on the East Coast is much longer. It's like 93 days, but we transact and move much faster here on the West Coast. But um, so a lot of the money that we have right now and we'll collect in this in this year won't be deployed until, you know, sometime mm -hmm. in the first quarter of next year. And that made me think of something. So you said the average exchange is completed upon the 61st day because uh, the greatest concern of an exchanger for someone who's pondering the idea is, hey, 
even if my building isn't the ideal asset, at least I, you, I know what I'm dealing with. And you're asking me to go into the unknown of will I find a property? So in general, and I know, you know, it's hard to gauge, but in general, do you have a, a, a big percentage of owners that you are coming to you and saying, oh, you know what? I, I just closed whatever, you know, something I wasn't really happy with, but I just did it to suffice the exchange rules. Do you see a, because I think the vantage point of a lot of owners who have got, not gone through an exchange is that, well, you're just going to be stuck buying whatever. Do you see that really playing out? That There's way? a lot of misconceptions about exchanges, right? So I get emails from agents all the time, typically not great ones, who say, hey, I've got a great property for a 1031 client. And that is keyword for me that it's overpriced, right? <laughs> so... And I always tell my customers that are in an exchange, so we complete 93% of our exchanges, right? So 93% of the deals that are open get completed, right? But there's a percentage of them or people that are not real sure that they're going to complete it anyway, right? So I have a client, a couple of clients right now that just opened deals and said, listen, I'm going to look for 45 days. If I find something I love, I'm going to buy it. And if I don't, I'm just going to go okay either way. Right? Mm -hmm. But I always tell my customers, and I know you probably preach the same thing, if you don't find something that you really want to buy, let's not buy it, mm -hmm. right? You never want to, and I very rarely have customers that go, oh, I just bought something because I didn't want to pay the taxes, right? I'm okay overpaying a little bit, right? So if I'm going to save 30% in taxes. If I get to pay, you know, three, four, five percent, sure. you know, more than I think it's worth, I'm okay with that as long as I like the property, right? Mm -hmm. But, and so that's what happens in most cases say in most cases people are paying market, they're not even really paying over market. But even if I had to pay a little more, I'd probably be you know, okay with it. But we're not seeing people that are just throwing themselves into property just to complete their exchange. Uh, so, and, and we complete a pretty high percentage of them. So I just don't think that that's very realistic. Sure, and, I, and personally I've never not once, truth, you know, voice, honor, code or whatever. <laughs> I've never had a client just buy whatever to fulfill the rule, but you know, of course, they're thinking, well, what else is a broker to say? So I wanted them to hear from someone who's doing, you know, many, many, many exchanges at any yeah. given time. So. Yeah, it's very, very, I, it's very rare where you have somebody that just goes, I'm just buying this because I don't want to pay my taxes. It's very rare. I would say I hear it maybe once or twice a year. And I, you know, I do for my customers, you know, on an average this year, somewhere between 200 to 230 deals a month. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very small number. Very good. All right, Greg. Well, thank yeah. you for your time. Thanks for letting me come in. I hope this was helpful. I hope this information is insightful, helps you along your uh, apartment multifamily ownership. Again, this is Chris German from The Apartment Dealer wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, and with the help of an accommodator, much protection from Uncle Sam. Until next time. Thank you. We have a lot of clients that are leaving the state. You know, not on the just on the apartment side, but I like to have a business owner that owned um, uh, selling his uh, industrial building. It's like a $16 million deal. And he's going like into that lease and he's, you know, moving out of state. Mm. You know, another guy in Burbank, he owns, uh, you know, like a, uh, like a nutritional company that he runs out of the warehouse. He's selling his company, he's building and he's leaving. Mm. You know, so um, there's a fair amount of people that are leaving the state. So that is when people say people are leaving the state. I mean, that's, Factual, you see it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So there's, a, a, you know, a, probably I speak to one or two people a month. You know, business owners that are either moving their business out of state or are um, just moving out of state, retiring and selling their business, getting out altogether, just they don't like yeah. the environment or it's yeah. time.